<laughs> Who's nine years old? Oh, yeah, well, I was nine, but I was nearly ten because I was only 23 days off being ten. I think it was. Was that right? Five, six, no, a bit more than that. Yeah, 24 days off being ten. And I thought I was a big boy because, you know what? Dad said, do you want to come to Kaikoi with me? And I said, yeah, I want to come to Kaikoi because Dad had a little old truck. And uh, he hadn't had it very long, just a couple of months, and he got the little old truck because Grandpa was coming to stay and Grandpa had come all the way from England. Do you know where England is on the map? That's a long way away. He had to get on a boat and it took him about one, two, three, four, five, I think, s or six weeks on a boat to come all the way from England. And Dad thought if we had a little old truck, we could take Grandpa to town now and again. We could take Grandpa to the beach and maybe to the forest and maybe he could visit some of our friends as well. So <coughs> I said, when are you going to town, Dad? And Dad said, oh, after Grandpa comes. Oh, I thought, that's going to be a long time away. When's Grandpa coming, Dad? And he said, oh, he'll be here soon. So a couple of weeks went by. And Dad said, we've got to go to Kaiko and pick up Grandpa. So we went to Kaiko and picked up Grandpa and he came up on a plane from Auckland on an old DC-3 plane. Now, you wouldn't know what that is, but some of the grown-ups would know. And he landed there and I remember this big aeroplane sitting with its nose up like that, sitting on the, uh, <coughs> on the uh, air, air strip at Kaiko and out of the back of the plane came Grandpa. And uh, then they brought some bags out, some big suitcases. And I thought, I wonder what Grandpa looks like. Because I'd never seen Grandpa, even though I was nearly 10 years old. Because Grandpa lived away in England, and we lived over here in New Zealand. And so Grandpa came, and Grandpa had white hair. And he had yellow teeth, because Grandpa smoked a pipe. And that made his teeth more yellow than mine. And uh, when I saw Grandpa, I thought, I wonder what sort of Grandpa he is. And uh, anyway, Grandpa gave me a hug and then gave Dad a hug because he hadn't seen Dad for um, how many years? Ten, about 20 years. And uh, so they talked a bit, then they hopped in the old truck with the bags on the back and I sat in the middle and it was all hot as hot because it was nearly Christmas time, you see. And when we got into town, Dad said... Now, I really need to go and buy a shirt. And so we stopped at the shop to buy Dad a shirt. And Grandpa and Dad went in the shop and I looked around and up and down in the shop. I didn't like anything there, but Grandpa said, Have you got a coat, Ken? Because my dad's name was Ken too. <coughs> Dad said, well, well, no, I haven't actually. And Grandpa said, Oh, you need a coat for Christmas, Ken? And Dad said, Why do I need a coat for Christmas? And he said, well, at Christmas you're always dressed with a coat and a tie and you've got to look just right on Christmas Day. Don't you do that in New Zealand? And Dad said, well, uh, it's a bit hot here, Grandpa, quite hot. And if we put on a coat and a tie, you know, we get all sweaty and wet and sticky and you feel uncomfortable and the sweat pours off you. And uh, Grandpa said, oh, but that's not right. In England we always dressed with a coat and tie for Christmas he said, have a look for a nice coat. So Dad had a look for a coat. And <coughs> uh, he saw a nice coat and Grandpa said, I'll buy you the coat for Christmas. It was a nice tweed coat, a jacket, a sports coat, they call them these days, I think. And it was a nice tweed one that looked really nice, but Dad only had his open shirt on and it didn't look quite right. And the man in the shop made him put on a white shirt and a tie and then tried the jacket on. He said, you look very nice, Mr. Curtis. That looks very nice. Where are you going to wear your coat? And Dad said, I'm going to wear it on Christmas Day. And the man in the shop shook his head a little bit and he couldn't quite understand because nobody wears a coat in New Zealand on Christmas Day because it's hot like it is today. And so <coughs> we got home with Dad with this paper bag with a coat in it and Grandpa and all his bags and they put it away. And on Christmas morning, Dad milked the cows and we did all the things and he came in and Dad had a wash and a shave, <coughs> and got all tidy and so on. And Grandpa came out of his room, and he had his nice great flannel trousers on, and his nice brown-coloured leather shoes on, and he had his nice shirt on, 
and it had a tie on with a nice gold tie pin with a gold chain going up here that went in his pocket and had his watch in it. And I've got that watch at my place today. Shouldn't tell you, should I? And uh, <coughs> he looked just so smart and his white hair and he was so dressed up for Christmas and Dad came out of his bedroom with his white shirt on and his tie on and his grey flannels on and his old black shoes on and his nice new jacket on. But by the time Dad got to lunchtime, you know what was happening? He was sweating. And all the perspiration was coming off him. And we sat in the kitchen and Mum had the fire going and a big <laughs> pot boiling a big pudding in the big pot. And it went bubble, 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 bubble for about six hours. And the kitchen was hot. And uh, <coughs> they sat on the old settee and they talked about old times. And Dad was wiping his forehead. <laughs> It was so hot and mum had to go and get dressed too and she put on her nice long dress that she used to wear for church and then she put her jacket on as well and she was so hot too. And, she was, and grandpa was sitting there and he was so hot too and the sweat was running down his face and dad said, I think we're too hot, we need to get our coats off, dad. And grandpa said, it's Christmas day, Ken. <laughs> and so <coughs> he kept this coat on and after a while, Grandpa said, do you mind if I have a pipe? And so he got his pipe out and he went tap, 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 tap on the old shell that we had for an ashtray. And he packed it full of tobacco and he lit his pipe. And he smoked his pipe for a little while and the sweat started to pour off him. And his hands were all wet. And, you know, after a while, you know, he said to Mum, he said, Olive, do you mind if I lie down? I really don't feel very good. <laughs> And Mum said, I think you better take your jacket off, Grandpa. And Grandpa said, it's Christmas Day, Olive. I always wear my coat on Christmas Day. But Grandpa went to the sitting room where it was a little bit cooler and he looked at the old couch in the sitting room and he lay down there and the sweat was still coming off him and his eyes were all dizzy, he couldn't see properly and he really wasn't feeling very good and we got him a drink of water and, <coughs> and I think Mum got some Aspros because that's the only thing we had and gave him some Aspros. And you know what? He didn't want to take his coat off. But you know what Dad did? While Grandpa was in the sitting room, lying on the bed, Dad took his coat off and he hung it up on the hook. And then he took his tie off and he threw it over the top of the coat. And he was just about to take his shirt off and Grandpa said, I think I feel a little bit better now. Maybe I'll be all right by dinner time. And Dad went in to see how he was doing. And you know what? Grandpa had taken his coat off and he threw it over the end of the sofa and he'd taken his tie off and threw that over too and he was just about going to open up his shirt buttons and cool off really nicely and he nearly took his shoes and socks off but not quite because it was Christmas Day. And <coughs> so Grandpa said, I'm sorry Ken, I don't want to embarrass you but I had to take my coat off, I was just a little bit too hot. And so Dad said, well, I thought the same. I don't want to embarrass you, Dad, but it was too hot. I had to take my coat off. <coughs> and so Grandpa, <coughs> Grandpa enjoyed the rest of his Christmas day without his coat and he even undid his buttons down one, two, three buttons, I think it was. And in the afternoon, late in the afternoon, he took his shoes and socks off and he put on a pair of sandals. And Grandpa learnt something about what we do in New Zealand for Christmas. And you know what? Grandpa could have felt a lot better if he'd listened to Dad in the first place. Wouldn't he have felt better? He wouldn't have been sick and he wouldn't have been embarrassed and he wouldn't have been sweating so much and he wouldn't have thought he'd done everything wrong if he just listened to Dad in the first place. And I think that's something about what Christmas is all about. Jesus wants us to listen to him in the first place and save ourselves a whole lot of trouble and we'll be a lot happier in the end. All right, it's time for the mums and dads, eh? Thank you for being such good listeners all the year. This might be the last olden days story, you never know, and I'm looking at Uncle Jim and uh, Grant. They won't be quite so old, but there's, where's Uncle Merv somewhere back there? He's got some terrible stories to tell you. <laughs> and there's, oh, there's a few phases around here. We'll see what happens next year.
yeah, there comes a time when uh, either the memory lapses or the experiences come to a uh, to an to an end, and you can't tell any more without having to admit that you are not telling the truth. So that would be terrible. But uh, people have often asked me, are my stories really true? And I always say to them, aha. <laughs> and so you can believe it or not. But I think you might get a clue that nobody could make up such stories as I tell. <clears throat> Let's get serious for a moment. And if you've got your Bible with you, you might want to turn to the book of Galatians. And we're in chapter 4, Galatians chapter 4. <clears throat> Here Paul puts in a little verse in a passage where he's really addressing some other matter, but uh, uh, he puts this little verse in to remind his readers about something of the qualities of Jesus, the one whom these readers have learnt about and decided to follow. So in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, and it reads... But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore you are no more servants, but a son." And I might add a daughter. And if a son or a daughter, then you are heirs of God through Christ. In other words, you inherit the things of God through Christ because Christ is the Son of God. Paul adds this little bit in here because it's the very essence of the Christian message that Jesus is the Son of God. If Jesus was any other than the Son of God and came to this world to propose that his sacrifice for our sins was sufficient to deal with our sins, then there would be a serious problem. Because it could be said that God was putting off his dirty work onto somebody else. You know, when the worst jobs have to be done, <coughs> who ought to be prepared to do it? The boss or the worker? Bosses don't like doing dirty work. In fact, in most instances, of course, if a man is a boss, he employs someone to do work for him. And if he has a number of people uh, employed, it's silly for him to do all the work and let the worker sit around on a box looking at him. That's ridiculous. But sometimes there are jobs to be done that only the boss can do just right and sometimes the job is so dangerous that he wouldn't dare entrust it even to the best of his servants. I'm amazed when I read the story of Abraham and some of those others who sent servants to go and get a wife for their son. And uh, if, uh, uh, if I'd gone to choose a wife for my son, I might have, might have made some terrible mistakes. Well, at least one mistake. And uh, that, that would be uh, something that I wouldn't want to do. But when it comes to the most significant and important event in all of history, it needs to be taken on by the one who makes the rules. The one who establishes what is the best for the eternal well-being of a whole universe. And God sent his son. But his son was not just a son as we would say a son, as we would call a son. This son, Jesus, was a son because he was born <coughs> of a woman, born to Mary and cared for by Joseph. But this son was called the son of man as well as the son of God. To understand this, you need to know something about how sonship worked in a Hebrew mentality. It doesn't work so much that way today, but in a Hebrew mentality, a son and sonship could actually mean someone who is not actually blood-related to you. Someone that you had taken into your care 
and had taken into your employ, perhaps, and uh, you had confidence in, and you had made them a son, and that son uh, became uh, adopted. And Paul talks a lot about being adopted into the family of God. And uh, because we accept Jesus Christ as the Son of God, we too can know that we are adopted into the family of God. Jesus came into this world so he could be part of the human family, not just the part of the Godhood. He came to this world so he could be associated with us so closely that we could at times only see humanity in him. And he was so associated with divinity, with God that is, that at times we could only see divinity in him. And so Jesus becomes a little mystery, doesn't he? And if Jesus ever ceases to be any sort of mystery in your mind, then you are failing in your obligation to research the qualities that make up Jesus the Messiah. He will forever remain somewhat a mystery. I was going to use the word enigma, but that's not really quite the right word. Jesus will always remain somewhat a mystery. For how is it that God could become man and at the same time remain God and at the same time be a human being? Well, the Apostle John tried to wrestle with this and he put it into words that we might find a little hard to understand but not difficult for his Hebrew readers. In John chapter 1 and verse 1 we read and on, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. This word was uh, uh, <coughs> the term logos, the original cause, the original one of eternity. And so in the beginning was the original one of all eternity, and this original one, this Word was with God, and the Word was God. He wasn't just God on his own. This Word was God, but he was also with God. He was part of and parcel of God, we might call it the Godhood, and I don't want to go into all that today, but uh, uh, John is trying to describe something of how we can understand this Jesus. The same was in the beginning with God. He was there, always there with God. And what's more, all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And more than that, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness, the old version says, comprehend it not. In other words, the darkness could not <coughs> overcome the light, that light that came into the world. John doesn't go and tell us about the birth of Jesus. He leaves that to others who had already written. But when we look at the birth of Jesus and we discover that he came to this world as vulnerable a child, a baby, as any other baby born into this world, in the need of the care and the sustenance that uh, infants need, uh, <coughs> we, uh, we see that uh, in Jesus' infancy and childhood, there seems to be nothing more about him except some sort of expression on his face that indicated royalty that indicated sovereignty. There was something about him because as we read those accounts, we find that the shepherds and the wise men see this Jesus baby and they recognize that there is a divinity already coming through the humanity, all being that the human is infant and is a baby. There is something different about Jesus. We don't understand entirely what made up Jesus. But there's more to be said from him. This man, verse 6, was sent from God, whose name was John. The same came for witness to bear witness to the light that all men through him might believe. But he was not the light, but was sent to bear witness to that light. You see, John did not have the qualities of Jesus. He had many of the characteristics of Jesus, but he didn't have the sum total of the qualities of Jesus. Jesus had something about him that John could never have. And although John was a great and uh, respected prophet 
And although Jesus said John was the greatest of all the prophets, John did not have what Jesus was had because John did not have this divinity within him that Jesus had. And so John deferred to Jesus because Jesus had something more. Jesus had what was needed to be a Messiah. Many people had arisen that the Jews thought would be a Messiah, but they didn't have what Jesus had because they were not divine and they were not human. They were not what was required to be a Messiah. In verse 9 it says, we're in John 1, That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world didn't recognize him. This Jesus who had made the world came to this world, but the world didn't recognize him for who he is, for who he was. And today we could say the same. The world really acknowledges the truth that Jesus was the Son of God. Son of man, Son of God. The one who was fitly credentialed to be the Messiah, the Saviour of the world. For being man, he could understand man. And as the Apostle Paul had said <laughs> uh, uh, had put it so succinctly, um, he suffered as we suffered. He learnt as we learnt. He knew the ups and downs that we have. And he bore the burdens that we have to bear. And so Jesus has a complete understanding. This was prophesied, of course, by the prophets of the Old Testament, that Jesus would be that kind of Messiah. One who could fully understand, not just understand, but fully understand. For in his divinity, he was able to perceive what was in the innermost thoughts at times of the people with whom he had to do. But people didn't recognize him as for who he was, apart from a faithful few. Because some did recognize him. Verse 12, as many as received him, that is, those few who received him, to them gave him the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And so those few who believed on him are able to claim sonship of God and therefore brotherhood with Jesus. I think it's important for us at Christmas time to recognize the uniqueness of Jesus. We often emphasize the manger, the humble birth of Jesus, and that's good. We don't want to forget that. But we must also remember that thousands of babies have been born in lesser comforts than Jesus was born in that stable that night. I know a man who was born in a potato field in Greece. His mother had him in a potato field away out in the back country of Greece. That's humble, isn't it? And uh, <clears throat> I know of a person who was born in a taxi. Not a nice, modern, sleek um, Holden Commodore taxi. One of those old Chev taxis. And there's been people who have been born in cow sheds, born in corn patches. I know someone who was born in a corn patch in a cornfield up in Omanaya. That's humble, isn't it? And... Uh, <clears throat> As we look at Jesus, we sometimes let our minds go too much towards the circumstances of his birth without thinking about the efficacy of his worth. Jesus was the Messiah from the moment he was born. Albeit a child in a manger, he was still the Messiah. He wasn't yet the mature Messiah, but he was still the Messiah because of the uniqueness of his being. So this Christmas, I want you to think about the uniqueness of Jesus, for this is what gives him his worth as your saviour and mine. Think about what he was, not just who he was, but what he was. And think about what it means to you to have a unique Messiah, 
one given of God, one who is God, but who is brother to us in our humanity as well. More than that, we dare not say, for we enter into the realm of speculation, and that realm of speculation may take us right away from the assurances we have in God's word that he is quite able and willing to save us. Well, just for something a little lighter, I occasionally uh, wax eloquent in poetry, and so I want to bring you the Christmas message uh, in poetry as I close. Of all mankind, there are but few who seek to understand things new, who, when confronted by a mystery, resolve to solve it and make history. The wise are those who dare to go away beyond the status quo. The fools, static in their thought, cannot advance in, though they're taught. And so it was one autumn night, a star unique in place and bright, shone down upon a distant clime, wise men who studied place and time. The star was wont to westward run, but followed not the setting sun. Brilliant in a starlit night, a wonder till the morning light. These men of Orient were not of suspicious bent. They had learned from written word the promise every Jew had heard, that they should soon receive a king, the death knoll to the Romans ring, who would sit on David's royal throne and build a nation all their own. Had not the Hebrew prophets spoken, would not the power of Rome be broken? Had not Daniel in his dream foretold of times and things unseen? Was not a virgin to conceive, or was this too much to believe? To have a son, (coughs) the sent (coughs) Messiah. So had said the seer Isaiah. These wise men of history resolved to solve the mystery, for they would never be content until they knew what things these things meant. They prepared themselves for distant travel, each upon his humble camel, in silence riding through the night toward the western star so bright. If they were soon to greet a king, they must a worthy present bring, for kings demanded earthly treasure to be expended at their leisure. To gold, no king would take offence, or for that matter, frankincense, or from the Himalaya, myrrh. There's no better gifts for regal spur. So these, the gifts the wise men brought, it was indeed a king they sought, but how to find in a foreign state a child of high and royal estate? Of Herod, these men sought direction. Where is the Jewish king, their question? For we of East have seen his star and would worship him, though from afar. These things are not in my domain. With priests and scribes, these things remain. And from this bunch of jealous men, the Christ should be born in Bethlehem. Now Herod made a sudden quest. He feigned in the child an interest. When you find him before you go, come back to me and let me know. But worship wasn't on his mind. He had ideas of another kind. In his evil uh, semi-Jewish head, he decided the Christ child should be dead. To Bethlehem, on the prophet's word, the wise men rode to see their Lord. To the twice-blessed town of a twice-blessed nation, where the star directed to a humble station. The one they saw was but a child, with childish mane and manner mild, but the Son of God they could perceive as they fell to worship on their knees. They presented gifts in the eastern way and rode off into a sunlit day and left the star behind that night, but it shone in their hearts forever bright. Not all wise men are from noble birth, For few are wise in this old earth. It's not given to a favoured few to be witness to a new world view. 
the men of the east were not so favoured to first see the one who for this world laboured. It was humble shepherds on an autumn sward who heard the anthem of angelic word, who received the news of a newborn king and left their sheep to see this thing, directed to a stable in a humble inn where Jesus in a manger slept within. No gifts to bring for the Holy One, of gold and perfumes they had none, but the greatest gift they left behind was a gift of love for all mankind. Then out upon that lonely hill, the shepherds heard the chorus still of God's good will to all on earth as witnessed by the Saviour's birth. The shepherds spread the God-sent word of all that they had seen and heard, and all who listened wondered long at the cheerful promise in the angel's song. Those souls of sinful bent we are, we rest our hope in a God-man star who sinless lived amongst us men that we might take our life again. Wise men who, today still living, searching, asking, praying, giving, will find the star, their light of day, and head for home a different way. So we'll close our service with uh, the use of our closing hymn. It's uh, number 75 if you're using your hymn roll. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you today that we can <clears throat> come to worship you for you are still the Saviour who is Christ the Lord. And we thank you for your care over us in the year past. We thank you for the blessings that have come from learning from your word. We thank you for the health and strength and protection you've given us. We thank you for many other blessings that we know not of. From that which we have been saved and uh, have never known it, we thank you as well. Now we thank you again that we have Jesus, our Saviour, and that we find our salvation in him and in him alone. And so dismiss us with this assurance, we pray, please, in Jesus' name. Amen.